So my advice to you right now as a human that has been doing yoga and meditating every morning for like the last four days straight is to just take a second to find your Zen and ground yourself right now, because this is going to be a lot. Hello, beautiful, favorite, gorgeous, best friends. Thank you so much for joining me once again back in our safe, cozy little space of the big wide internet. I hope you are having a fabulous day so far. I hope you all had a wonderful Easter. I know it seemed like ages ago, but low key, I'm still eating my son's Easter eggs and hoping that he doesn't notice. So it's it's still relevant, okay? Happy Easter. I miss you all like crazy. Sorry for the long break. We've had Easter, we've had school holidays here in Australia. And also I just have a very big case today that took a lot of researching and scoping out. And it was this close to being another multi-parter. And I went back and forth, but I thought, no, instead we can just have like an almost feature length hangout. So I'm excited. Anyway, if you are new here, hi, hello, welcome. It's so nice to meet you. My name is Liz and I am so happy that you randomly clicked on this video. Pro tip, just so you know, it's not just you and me here today. We are joined as usual by my beautiful guest star slash real star of the show, Lily, because she is a queen that refuses to be locked out while I record. And because she knows that sometimes we need emotional support breaks when things get too intense around here, which happens all the time because all we talk about here is true crime and mysteries and that kind of thing. So, you know, sometimes it gets heavy around here. Yes. So we appreciate you so much. You're our emotional support angel. Yes, you are. Yes. I know they all came here to see you. There's no need to rub it in. And with all of that said, it's time to get into today's case and it is a big one. I'm not going to harp on too much right now because we have a whole lot to get through, but best friends in the US, you've probably already heard about this case. At least I really hope so, because if not, someone in law enforcement or the media is definitely doing their job wrong. But if you live on my side of the world, chances are you will not have heard about it. For some reason, it got very little international coverage over here. And even here on YouTube, I feel like it gets very little coverage. And I'm kind of surprised that this one isn't right up there with like your John Bonet and your Chris Watts and your Kaylee Anthony. But I've started harping when I said I wouldn't. So grab your drinks and your snacks and let's dive in. So we're going back in time to the 10th of April, 2001, just one week before Easter. And we're headed to a quiet suburban cul-de-sac in Scottsdale, Arizona, USA. It was a Tuesday morning, so a lot of the residents would have been busy getting ready for their day, about to head to work, packing school lunches, maybe going for a morning jog. But at 8.42 a.m., the suburban daily quiet was quite literally shattered by an explosion in one of the houses that rattled the windows of the home surrounding it for half a mile in all directions. Immediately, call after call started flooding into 911 dispatches, with all of these callers frantically reporting the same event. The explosion, which had been strong enough to completely collapse the front wall of the house. And now there was a rapidly growing fire that was quickly tearing through the rest of the house. This fire was huge. We're talking 20 foot flames. And the only reason it didn't spread is because neighbors in the surrounding homes were using their garden hoses to try and keep the blaze under control as best they could before firefighters arrived. When firefighters did arrive though, they were forced to keep their distance at first due to a collection of smaller secondary explosions in the home caused possibly by rifle ammunition or maybe paint cans inside and all the while neighbors watched on in horror knowing that the family that lived in that home could still be inside the house as it was reduced to barely more than rubble before the fire was finally brought under control and extinguished. And the firefighters were feeling this as well, even though there was nothing that they could have done to bring that fire under control any quicker. One of them later said in an interview that as soon as he arrived on the scene, he immediately knew from the smell of the smoke that there were people inside that home. And he was right. 
Once the fire was finally out and police made their way into the backyard to look into the burnt remains of the home, they could clearly make out three bodies burned beyond all recognition lying in their beds. And having already spoken with the neighbours that knew the family that lived there, they immediately knew from the size of two of these bodies that they were the 12-year-old Brittany Fisher and her brother, 10-year-old Bobby Fisher. Now, the third body could have belonged to either one of Brittany and Bobby's parents, 39-year-old Robert Fisher or his wife, 38-year-old Mary Fisher. But it was quickly confirmed that the third victim was Mary. And it was also quickly confirmed that the victims had not died as a result of the explosion or the resulting fire. They had all been murdered before the explosion ever took place, something that the very first investigators on the scene had suspected from the beginning when they saw these bodies lying in their beds, something that would have been expected if there had just been a fire and maybe they had been knocked out by the smoke before they had even woken up, but not after an explosion. Like there should have been some kind of sign that these people had gotten out of bed and made some sort of attempt to escape the banning home. The autopsies would later reveal that the murders themselves had been particularly callous and brutal. Both Brittany and Bobby's throats had been slashed from ear to ear, nearly to the point of decapitation. Mary's throat had also been slashed, but she had also been shot in the back of the head, execution style. And then when it came to the explosion itself, it would quickly be determined that it had been caused intentionally by someone disconnecting the gas line from the furnace, spreading an accelerant, most likely gasoline, throughout the hallways, and then leaving a candle lit in the home. So basically the home had slowly filled up with gas, which had eventually descended to the level of the candle and combusted when it made contact with the open flame. Now I'm sure we can all make a pretty safe bet as as to where authorities' minds were headed, but they couldn't get ahead of themselves just yet. Just because the entire family had been murdered, the house had been rigged to explode, and the only one missing was Robert, it didn't automatically mean that he was responsible for any of it. Like this early on, there was just ample room for doubt and endless possibilities. Robert might have also been a victim, and it was just that his body hadn't been found in the wreckage yet. Robert could have just been at work thinking it was a normal day having no idea whatsoever what had happened to his family. But when police tried to contact Robert at the Mayo Clinic where he worked as a surgical technician, they were told that Robert hadn't shown up for work that day. No one in law enforcement or any of Robert's friends and family could get through to him on his phone. And as the hours turned to days and Robert still failed to appear despite news of the explosion and his family's deaths being blasted all over the TV and radio, that room for doubt that had been there was very steadily shrinking. At the scene when police were taking an inventory of what was missing from the home, they noticed that while Robert's truck was in its usual place in the driveway, damaged by the garage roof collapsing on it, Mary's white Toyota 4Runner SUV was nowhere to be found. There were also a number of guns found in an expensive gun safe in the home, and while none of these guns were would be linked to the bullet found in Mary's head, the bullet would later be determined to be the exact caliber of the only missing gun, a 357 Magnum. And as if these details weren't already damning enough, also missing from the home were almost all of Robert's clothes and a lot of his personal belongings. And when police spoke with the neighbors, they said that the night before the explosion, a lot of them had heard this big, massive fight between Robert and Mary. Like, a big apocalyptic screaming match of a fight, but everything had gone silent at 10 p.m. And then police came across footage from an ATM just down the road from the Fisher home of Robert withdrawing cash at 10.43 p.m. with Mary's forerunner clearly visible parked behind him. Now, the process of the house slowly filling with gas before it exploded was estimated to have taken somewhere between 10 and 12 hours. So, a clear timeline was quickly becoming evident to police. They suspected that at some point very soon after this huge fight heard by the neighbours, Robert brutally murdered his family, 
packed up his stuff and rigged the house to explode before driving to that ATM and then taking off God knows where, leaving investigators with this daunting realization that when that house exploded, Robert already had this huge 10 to 12 hour head start on them. Like he could be anywhere by this point. Now the media coverage of this case, I mentioned it briefly before, but it was absolutely wild from the beginning. Like the fire itself was broadcast live on the news into the homes of Scottsdale residents and on a broader scale, drawing heaps of attention on a national level. So if Robert was still alive and completely innocent, there was just no way after a certain point that he didn't know what had happened to his family. And very early on, police suppressed the news that Mary, Brittany and Bobby had been murdered. So all the public knew was that the family's home had exploded and they had died. And police did this hoping that Robert, thinking that the explosion and the fire had destroyed all the evidence of the murders themselves, like he had most likely planned, would come forward playing the grieving man who's just found out he's lost his entire family. Like, oh my God, my family, what happened? A few days into the investigation, though, unfortunately someone in law enforcement kind of dropped the ball and let the information about the murders slip during an interview with the media. And they still tried to play it cool a little while longer, stressing that while Robert it was a vital piece of the investigation. He was not a suspect, but it was revealed on the 14th of April, just three days after the murders, that Robert was officially the only person of interest and that a warrant had been issued for his arrest. So investigators were obviously doing the rounds, interviewing the Fisher family's friends, their family, Robert's co-workers, you know, obviously trying to find out where exactly Robert would be and why he would have murdered his family. But as they were doing this, they almost found like there were these two different versions of Robert for them to try and get to know. A lot of the people that investigators were speaking with were just saying that they could not bring themselves to believe that Robert could have done this. Understandably, I mean, the whole thing was just so unspeakably horrific that it was hard to believe that anyone would have been capable of doing this. In fact, straight after the murders, Bill Cooper, Mary's father, had actually been one of the most outspoken in Robert's defense in the media. There's this one heartbreaking interview he gave to the press where he's just answering questions and then all of a sudden he kind of wells up and looks at the camera and just begs Robert to come home, saying how much he loves him and that the family doesn't know what happened or know anything for sure, but they just want to hear from him and know that he's safe. And police were mostly hearing Robert described as quiet and reserved, as a family man and a good old-fashioned dad, as a man of God heavily involved in his church. And people said that while sure, there was no doubt that Robert was the king of his castle, like of his home, so to speak, and that there was definitely structure in the Fisher home, there had never been any signs that he might have been abusive in any way. Quite the opposite. He had always been super loving and caring and affectionate to both the kids and to Mary. But then there were these accounts coming in from people that had seen this other side to Robert, who described him as cocky and conceited, as a little bit offbeat and obviously very intelligent but kind of difficult to talk to because as you spoke, you could see the gears working as he analyzed every little thing you said. So you were left kind of feeling on edge. Robert had been born on the 13th of April 1961 in Brooklyn, New York, and moved later to Tucson, Arizona with his parents and two sisters. But in 1976, when he was 15 years old, Robert's parents split up. It sounds like the marriage had been heading that way for a good long while. And while it doesn't seem like there was any physical abuse going on in the house, Robert's dad was said to be super controlling and strict to the point where Robert's mum couldn't take it anymore and eventually decided enough was enough and she left the family. Robert's father ended up getting full custody of Robert and his sisters and he remarried a woman that was said to have been very hard on Robert and out of the three kids it was Robert himself that seemed to be the most affected by what was said to be a very turbulent and unsettling divorce to the point where years later Robert would straight up refuse to take Brittany and Bobby to Disney 
Disneyland because that's where his parents had their last big screaming match before the divorce. And Robert was still talking about the divorce decades later to his co-workers at the Mayo Clinic in Scottsdale, seeming to mostly blame his mother for the whole thing and saying that he himself would never get divorced because he wouldn't ever want his children to go through what he did. So he had always taken marriage very seriously. Like it was always going to be something that was going to be a lifelong commitment to him. Divorce was not an option. Robert was straight out of high school when he enrolled in the Navy in 1979 and he served until 1982. Robert did attempt to join the Navy SEALs and went through all of the really intense training for that, but ended up not getting accepted. From there, he went on to become a firefighter in rural San Diego before he injured his back really badly on the job to the point where he needed surgery and had to retire. And that was when he moved into the medical field and worked as a respiratory bleh, respiratory technician and also as a surgical technician. So he really was a jack of all trades. On a side note, you guys remember the Steve Rico case and how his wife, Kim Rico, was a surgical technician as well? Like, how coincidental is that? We're watching you, surgical techs. Just, just kidding. But like, is there something you're not telling us? Oh, hi. Yes, we're watching those surgical techs, aren't we? Hey, Was that your belly or mine? <laughs> so when it comes to Robert and Mary, the couple met when they were just 16 years old and still in high school. Mary was a really good friend of one of Robert's sisters. And Mary was described as someone who was incredibly kind and really fun to be around. She was also very committed to her faith, having been born and raised in a really religious household. So chances are that she took marriage very seriously as well, even though as far as I know, her parents were still together. So she didn't have that trauma in her past that Robert did. Robert and Mary got married in 1987, which I found a little bit intriguing because at this point, Robert would have been 26 and Mary 25. And I'm not sure if Robert was heavily involved in the church already or not, but Mary definitely was. And usually, like I'm not saying this is always the case, but usually a lot of the time you do find that people in the Christian church tend to get married a bit younger. So with Robert and Mary meeting, like I said, back when they were teenagers, I'd I don't know, maybe they were dating on and off. Maybe there were already issues in the relationship. Or maybe I'm just being an ignorant Australian and it had something to do with Robert being in the Navy for a few years. But anyway, when they did get married in 1987, they settled in their home in Scottsdale, not too far from Mary's parents. And their daughter, Brittany, was born a year later in 1988. And Brittany was described as incredibly intelligent and studious. In fact, literally the night of the murders, she had just been inducted into the National Junior Honor Society. Mary's father, Bill Cooper, said that anyone would have thought that Brittany was a nerd, those are his words, not mine, except that on top of her hectic, demanding school schedule, she was a heck of an athlete as well and played both basketball and soccer. Bobby was born in 1991 and he was described as a firecracker and just a really neat kid. He was really close with his big sister, Brittany. He loved drawing and fishing with his dad. And he was also a member of the bell choir at the family's church. Mary was said to be an excellent devoted mother. Like once Brittany and Bobby were born, that was it. They were her life. And as a stay at home mom, she was always really involved in every aspect of the kids' lives. She was a regular volunteer at their school and at the church where the Fisher family spent a lot of their time. Mary volunteered at the children's church. Robert would attend the men's ministry nights every Tuesday. Bobby, as we said, was on the bell choir and Brittany was also said to be very committed to her faith and her relationship with God. So the Fisher's life was pretty much said to revolve around firstly the church and secondly the great outdoors. Like they loved camping, they loved quad riding, hunting, fishing, all of that, especially Robert. 
Robert was an avid and enthusiastic outdoorsman and a skilled hunter and fisher, but those that would go on hunting and camping trips with him would say that he found his thrill not in the hunt, but in the kill itself. And over the years, Robert's hunting buddies had one by one kind of stopped wanting to go hunting with him altogether because he made them feel uncomfortable and even on some occasions unsafe. One friend told the police about this time when a bunch of them had gone on a hunting trip and Robert had just leapt out of the moving car before they'd even stopped to run around like a maniac and just fire his gun haphazardly into the air. He did this another time as well as a joke when he snuck up on a family in the forest who were just innocently having a picnic and just emptied his ammo into the air behind them, which Robert thought was hilarious. But obviously his mates and this family were all like, dude, what is wrong with you? Another guy spoke about an instance where he and Robert were gutting an elk that they had killed and he looked up and realized that Robert had smeared the blood from this elk all over his face and body. And unrelated to hunting, but kind of related to Robert getting that thrill from the kill, there was also this incident in 1989 where Robert shot a stray pit bull that he claimed had come into his front yard and attacked his dog. And after police carried out a little investigation, they didn't press any charges. But there were people that knew Robert that said that he had wanted to shoot that pit bull. Like he decided he wanted to shoot it when he saw it roaming around and had just said that it attacked his dog as an excuse. But I mean, that part of the story is just alleged and not many people saw this side of Robert. And so from outside appearances, the Fishers seem to be a completely normal, loving, stable family. But as is so often the case, appearances were far from reality. It seemed like even though, or I don't know, maybe because Robert had been so affected by his parents' divorce, he had kind of turned into his father and he needed to be in control of everything that happened in that house, right down to the decor. Like all of the walls had to be white and Mary wasn't allowed to hang up the kids' artwork. She wasn't allowed to use these beautiful patchwork quilts that her mum had made for her and the kids or have them on display because Robert decided he didn't like them. And Mary had to run even the most mundane everyday things by Robert before she went ahead. Mary on numerous occasions called Robert's mum, the one that left the family, saying that she didn't know what to do. She loved Robert, but he was impossible to live with, that he was this tough love husband with this impossibly high standard for both her and the kids and always had to have everything his way. And Robert's mum's response was basically, yeah, that's exactly what I had to deal with with his father. There's no changing his ways. You're going to have to deal with it, but be firm with him. And it sounds like Mary took this advice on board. Like that big fight that she and Robert had the night of the murders, that was apparently nothing out of the ordinary. Their neighbors reported hearing them fight all the time about sex, money, how they hated each other, couldn't stand each other. And the neighbors said that during these fights, you would really only hear Mary shouting. Robert was usually always very quiet and calm, which some people take as Mary being the instigator, but I think it's more likely that she was gaslit by Robert, who, no matter how well he managed to maintain his cool during these fights, was obviously still affected because when these fights happened, if it was a really bad one, he would just pack up and leave and go on a long weekend, sometimes a whole week on a camping trip, just him and the family dog, Blue. And I know there are some couples that are able to make this kind of arrangement work, like parting ways after a fight or during a fight and then coming back together when both of the parties have cooled off. But clearly this wasn't working out for Robert and Mary because by 2001, when the murders took place, Robert and Mary had been married for 14 years. And during that time, their marriage had all but disintegrated. Like, things were seriously critical. There were rumors of infidelity on both sides and the couple were undergoing marriage counseling by the pastor of their church, who, side note, is allegedly the man that Robert believed Mary was having an affair with. But there's no evidence that this was true and the rumors of an affair are actually much easier to substantiate on Robert's side. So about a year before the murders, Robert had gone to this massage parlor because of his back injury from when he was a firefighter. 
He had obviously had the surgery to fix it, but it was still causing him pain. And so he went to this massage parlor for a massage and instead ended up having an affair. <laughs> and there's Two different ways I've heard this story told. Robert's sister said that at this massage parlor, Robert just kind of fell into temptation. But I've also heard it said that Robert spoke to friends about this affair before it took place. Like he had gone for this massage planning on cheating on Mary. But either way, this affair bit him in the butt and like somewhere else as well, because he got a really bad UTI that laid him up in bed for a week. And when Robert came clean about his infidelity to a couple of people at his church, they were like, well, you need to tell Mary, who was already suspicious because she was like, how did you get this UTI? When Robert did own up to Mary, the couple separated briefly for a while before she agreed to forgive him and try and fix marriage. But it's alleged that it wasn't all that long after all of this happened that Robert started another affair that Mary found out about because I guess things were just that toxic by this point that he was just kind of flaunting it in her face to just See what would happen, I guess. And in the weeks leading up to the murders, it seemed like Mary was done. She officially wanted out. Despite being a stay-at-home mother all of these years since Brittany was born, Mary had started working part-time at her friend's medical clinic and was actively telling those close to her that she was saving up her wages for when she left Robert because she wanted a divorce and was finally ready to end this marriage. Oh, hi. Yeah, Mary was out of there. <coughs> oh, oh my goodness. Hi, can you do pull? Can we do pull? Pull? Oh, you're so clever. Okay, bye. So now it's time for us to circle back to the day of the murders, Monday the 9th of April 2009, and kind of go through the timeline as police believe things played out. That day was relatively normal. Everyone went about their usual routine. It sounds like Robert was off work or had a late start because that day he changed the insulation in the attic and changed the oil in his car, which are weird things for him to be doing if the murders were premeditated and the explosion like, why change the insulation in your attic if you're planning on blowing up the house? And why would he have changed the oil in his car and then taken off in Mary's? Then that night, Robert took Brittany to her ceremony where she was supposed to be honored for being inducted into the National Junior Honor Society, an event that Mary wasn't able to attend because she was taking Bobby to a gun safety class. But at the ceremony, Robert, for some reason, grew really impatient and took Brittany home before before she had even gotten the chance to go on stage and accept her certificate. Later that night, once the family was all home and the kids had gone to bed, Robert and Mary, as we know, had one of their big apocalyptic fights. None of the neighbors called the police because as we've established, this was nothing new or out of the ordinary for them. And so police theorized that maybe during this fight, Mary mentioned wanting a divorce, which from what we know about Robert and his past with his parents' divorce would have just been like the end of the world. And so the working theory is that Robert decided then and there that he would prefer to kill Mary and his children than to get divorced and have Brittany and Bobby go through what he did and potentially have someone else come in and have a part in raising them if Mary met and married someone new. So there's this massive fight and then everything goes quiet at 10 p.m. And police say that this is when Robert went upstairs to his children's bedrooms and murdered them in their beds while they were sleeping. So they they believe that he killed Brittany and Bobby first and we know they were in their beds because even though their bodies were burnt underneath them where they had been laying, their beds were just soaked in blood. And police believe that Robert then murdered Mary, first by cutting her throat as he had with his children and then shooting her in the back of the head execution style. I've heard some of the officers that work this case refer to the shot as the FU shot, you know, very clearly a case of overkill because Mary more likely than not would have already been dead before Robert shot her. Robert then packed up his stuff and rigged the house to explode exactly the way you would expect a firefighter to rig an explosion, by the way, you know, with the accelerant and the gas line and the candle. And then he took Mary's car and the dog blue and got the heck out of Dodge with what he knew would be a very solid head start, but not before stopping at that ATM just down the road at 10.43 p.m. like we spoke about earlier. But something that I didn't mention is that all 
Robert took out of this ATM was $280, even though there was more money in this account and he had other accounts that he could have accessed. And there's different theories about this because if Robert's plan was to go on the run and evade capture, he obviously would have wanted to get his hands on as much money as he could, right? $280 isn't going to get you very far if you want to start a new life somewhere. He would need a new identity, a new social security number, a new home, a new car. Like it's all going to add up very quickly. And there was no sign ever found that Robert had been stockpiling cash or funneling money into some secret account. So why just the $280? I have heard it said that $280 was the max amount that he could draw out of the ATM at one time. Like there was a limit on either the ATM itself or on his account. But I don't know, $280 sounds like a pretty random amount for a limit. And Robert never accessed this account or any of his other accounts ever again. But something I was thinking about was how Robert's go-to after one of his and Mary's big fights was to go off camping for a couple of days because while $280 isn't going to get you a whole new life, it sounds just about right for an impromptu weekend camping trip, right? So if Robert did do this, maybe he was trying to make it look like after that big fight, he had just gone camping. Like maybe he really was planning, like police were hoping, to just turn up after a couple of days like, oh my God, what happened to my family? But then changed his mind when he saw the media coverage and saw that he was a suspect. But police suspected that Robert had gone off the grid and they knew he was very familiar with the camping and hunting grounds in the area and thought that he could maybe be hiding out in the woods. And they were focusing on one of the areas that he would quite often go camping, which was Payson, about 80 miles or an hour and a half drive northeast of Scottsdale. But their search efforts were turning up nothing. They also also had plain clothed police officers attend a memorial service for Mary, Brittany and Bobby on the 17th of April, thinking that maybe Robert might show up on the down low, but they never saw him. And then on the 20th of April, 10 days after the murders, there was this huge breakthrough. Mary's white Toyota 4Runner was found deep in the Tonto National Forest, about 100 miles from the Fisher family home and not all that far from the area in Payson that police had been searching. And when I say deep in the forest, the car was found about 40 miles down a long back road off the main road. And then whoever was driving went off road and drove even further into the woods. So a really rural area. All of the windows of the car were down and strangely, the side mirrors were pushed in like they would be if someone was trying to park in a really tight spot. And underneath the car was Blue, the family dog, all on his own, some hungry and thirsty. And he had actually built himself like this little bed underneath the car. And apparently he had porcupine needles stuck in his mouth. So he'd obviously tried to do some hunting, but probably picked the wrong prey. It reminds me of Homeward Bound where Chance goes after a porcupine and gets the needles stuck in his mouth as well. Like, Poor pups. Now there's so many differing reports about how long Blue and the car had been there, ranging from less than one day to up to five. But to give you like an average estimation from all of these different reports, based on the amount of pine needles on the car itself and Blue's condition, we're gonna say that the car had been there for roughly two or three days. And remember, this is 10 days after the murders. And there is a lot to unpack with this car. Firstly, the interior of the car was spotless. It had obviously been meticulously cleaned. There was no blood, no fingerprints, no hair or any other fibers to be found anywhere throughout the entire car, except for a single fingerprint found on a coffee cup, which was later matched to Robert. And also in the car, the police found the Raiders cap that Robert had been wearing in the ATM footage. But here's where things start to get really bizarre. So there was no DNA found in or on the coffee cup. So a single fingerprint, yes, but no evidence that Robert had actually drank from that cup at all, which seems strange. And then even stranger, outside Mary's car on the ground by the passenger door was a literal pile of human excrement. Yeah, poop. So assuming this was Robert's poop, this had to be some kind of statement, right? But to who? To Mary? To the authorities? Like, haha, now you guys literally have to investigate my poop. 
Who knows? So following the discovery of the car, authorities swarmed in to search the surrounding area for Robert, thinking he could still be hiding out in the forest somewhere, right? And this was a huge three-day stakeout that has received a fair amount of criticism over the years and kind of for good reason. Firstly, it sounds like the search efforts were mainly headed up by the Scottsdale SWAT team, who would have been more than likely a little bit out of their element out there in the forest because they would have been more used to and equipped for urban and metropolitan areas like buildings and houses, not out there in the wilderness. Like I can't imagine that they would know how to search for tracks and telltale signs that someone had been camping out in the forest. And this might be the reason why only one square mile around the car was ever searched thoroughly and why they only searched one of the 30 odd caves within a quarter mile radius of where the car was found. This cave was called Cave 41 and there were footprints found leading up to the entrance of this cave and authorities did go all out on this one cave. They used night vision cameras, spelunkers, cadaver dogs and like these fancy robot cameras on wheels usually used in sewers and there was nothing found but like what about the other caves? If they had all those resources and the people there it's just Hard to understand why they didn't at least try and search a few of the other caves. There's this one interview that quite literally put shivers down my spine when I saw it, where one of the searchers tells the press, there's literally every chance that he's standing here watching us right now. Talking about Robert, of course, and it was true because literally less than one mile away from where the Toyota was found was the Fort Apache Indian Reserve, an area where police were not permitted to search without permission and supervision from the White Mountain Apache tribe, something which honestly, it seems like they never even attempted to approach the tribe and ask for. So there was this whole big area of roughly 2,700 miles that was never searched. And it is highly likely that Robert knew that police wouldn't be able to search that reserve because he knew this area very well. In fact, he had been there just one week prior to the murders with a family friend on this camping trip. And on this trip, this friend was struck by just how well Robert was able to navigate the area, even at night. And so after the murders, this friend and his wife were talking like, was that trip all about Robert scouting the area for good places to hide? Like, had Robert always been planning on disappearing into those woods after the murders? Eventually, after three days, these search efforts had to be called off because there was fog and rain and snow coming in, just really awful weather conditions. But following the news breaking of Mary's car being found, police had received a couple of leads from the public suggesting that Robert wasn't hiding out in those woods at all. There was one couple that said, several days before the car was found, they had seen a man matching Robert's description walking along Young Road, which was the main road, easily hiking distance away from the car. And the woman and the couple said that she made eye contact with this guy and turned to her husband and said, that looks like Robert Fisher. And she said that when this eye contact occurred, she felt that the guy did seem spooked, like he was worried he had been spotted. However, they didn't report the sighting until after the news broke that the car had been found close by. So there was really every chance that Robert had hiked to this main road and hitched a ride out of the area. And there was another tip that came in from this woman who tended bar at the Rye Creek Diner, Rye being a town quite close to Payson. And this woman told the police that while she was working, a man and a woman came in and the woman went to the restroom while the man came up to the bar, ordered a drink, and then went and stood by the fireplace, making what seemed like a very deliberate effort to hide his face, like keeping his head ducked and facing away from the crowd. And she said that when the woman came out of the restroom, they appeared to be having some kind of argument. And then the very next night, police received a report that a random woman had knocked on a door of this random home in Rye in the middle of the night, asking the people inside if she could use their phone to call a taxi because she and her boyfriend had had this big fight and he had dumped her on the side of the road and just driven off. Now, full disclosure, I couldn't work out where exactly in the timeline this was all supposed to have occurred or how deeply these tips were investigated by police, but these 
these tips were adding to the police's suspicions that maybe Robert was receiving assistance from someone else, maybe a family member or a friend or possibly the woman that he was supposed to be having an affair with at the time of the murders. Because when I mentioned earlier that there were no hair or fibres found in Mary's car, this included any hairs from Blue, the dog. So how on earth did Blue get into that forest unless maybe Blue was taken there in a second car driven by an accomplice who was potentially funding Robert's escape, explaining him just taking $280 out and that was how Robert got out of the woods or maybe Robert had previously left another car out there in the forest as his getaway. A lot of people believe that there was no way that if Robert walked out of those woods that Blue would have stayed by the car and not followed him. But I kind of personally disagree with this. Like with what we know about Robert and how strict he was with Mary and the kids and how he was a bit of a control freak, there's no doubt in my mind that he would have had Blue trained to a T. Like I feel like that dog would have done whatever Robert commanded, even if it meant staying by that car for days on end, hungry, with no food or water, and no idea when Robert was going to come back. Now, if you're not familiar with this case, here's the part where I break to you that the discovery of Mary's car in the woods was the last major breakthrough in this case and the last indication of Robert's whereabouts because Robert Fisher has never been found. And on the 29th of June 2002, so just over a year after the murders with no other real breakthroughs in the case, the FBI officially announced Robert as the 475th fugitive to be placed on their top 10 most wanted list and offered a $100,000 reward for any information leading to his capture. And statistically, most of the fugitives placed on this list are captured and apprehended within one year. And yet still, somehow, there has not been been one single trace of Robert found in the 21 years since the murders. There are people that believe that Robert never made it out of those woods, that after committing the murders, he then drove to the Tonto Forest and ended his own life, or maybe that he died accidentally while trying to evade capture. And we're going to dive more deeply into those theories at the end of this video. But there are also a large amount of people, including a lot of those in law enforcement, that fully believe that Robert did absolutely make it out of those woods and that he successfully started a new life with a new identity and that even though it's been 21 years, he could still be alive out there somewhere. It's estimated that there were about 10,000 tips about Robert that came in between 2001 and 2011 and even now tips still come in on a weekly and daily basis and these signings and tips have come in from all over the place. We're talking all over the states obviously but also Mexico, Guatemala, Argentina, Canada, and the list just goes on because basically, really, Robert could be anywhere. The murders occurred just a few months before September 11th, so it would have been a hell of a lot easier for Robert to slip through immigration with a fake passport and ID and just end up in a different country than it would have been today. In August 2001, a phone call came into America's Most Wanted, who had added Robert to their Dirty Dozen list of the most notorious fugitives and this caller claimed to be Robert Fisher and all he said was something along the lines of I'm glad I killed the bitch you'll never find me and then he hung up. Police did investigate this call and they traced it of all places to a pizzeria in Chester, Virginia but they were never able to confirm whether or not the caller was Robert and it's kind of easy to brush this one off. I know I originally did but this call actually came in one week after America's Most Wanted had run their segment on Robert Fisher and to me a week is a whole long time for someone to still be thinking about that segment and decide to pull like a prank or a dare. It just seems more like something someone would do if they had been stewing over that segment all week and who else would be doing that other than Robert himself. Moving on, in the years immediately following Robert's disappearance, people living in his old neighborhood would report seeing Robert driving around in the area. And in June 2003, a woman called the police and told them that she had seen Robert sitting in
in an older model white truck with a temporary license plate literally right out front of the site where his house had once stood. But police did track down this man and it wasn't Robert. It was just some guy circling around the block looking for junk to salvage. And then in February 2004, authorities received their most promising lead yet. And it's it's pretty crazy. So a call came in from the Royal Canadian Mounted Police in Vancouver because they had arrested a man with a very striking resemblance to Robert after a cluster of several reported sightings in a town called White Rock. And this guy not only was the spitting image of Robert, like the same hair, the same physical build, the same bone structure, everything, he also had a missing bicuspid tooth where Robert had a gold tooth and he had the exact same scar on his back from the surgery that Robert had undergone for his back injury. And authorities were so certain that they had their man that they reached out to a neighbor of the Fishers who lived next door to them for decades, like since the 80s. And they carried out this almost sting operation where the neighbor would fly to Vancouver and pretend to be a convict getting processed in this jail. And they would bring through this potential Robert and see if he could confirm that it was him. To me, it seems like a bit of a convoluted, like dramatic operation, but I'm sure they had their reasons. Anyway, this guy agrees. And he said that when this Robert walked in, he did like this sweep of the room with his eyes. And when he saw his neighbor, they both recognized each other. Like this man originally skimmed over him and then immediately did a double take and locked eyes with him, almost like, what the hell are you doing here? So the neighbor tells the police, you know, you got him. That man in there, without a doubt, is Robert Fisher. And he leaves to go back home to Arizona and tells his parents, you know, they got him. They finally caught him, only to find out a week later that police let the man go because his fingerprints didn't match. And this was a devastating blow because everyone was so certain that this was Robert, especially the Canadian authorities. Like when Canadian police realized that aside from a minor criminal record, they couldn't account for this man's whereabouts since 1991, they continued to hold him for that entire week, refusing to rule out any connection to Robert. It wasn't until the man's mother came in and was like, no, this is definitely not Robert Fisher, he's my son, that they finally released him. And there are theories that maybe with his background in the medical field and the Navy, that Robert would have had the know-how and the ability to alter his fingerprints, which I mean, isn't completely unheard of. And this is actually what the Fisher's neighbor believes. Like he is 130% convinced that the man he saw was Robert Fisher and that the police let him go. But the Scottsdale Police Department said that this whole thing in Vancouver had been blown out of proportion in the media and that it wasn't all that different from a couple of other arrests there had been of men that they had also believed to be Robert but whose fingerprints also hadn't matched. And they said that even if Robert had been successful in altering his fingerprints, that would have involved him burning his fingertips with acid or fire. So there would have been scarring, but there was no scarring present. But there are still people that believe this theory to this day that police had Robert Fisher and they just let him go. Hello, sleepyhead. I heard you snoring before. Did they let him go? Do you think it was Robert? Do you think it was? It was actually only a few months after this in June 2004 that there was another potential sighting of Robert, this time in Guatemala, where a group of tourists had been just innocently taking photos in this marketplace when all of a sudden this man stalked over to them and snapped at them, why are you taking pictures of me? Because he had been in the background of some of their shots and this man got really irate and tried snatching the camera off them saying, I've killed before. I'll kill again. And the FBI did fly out to Guatemala to investigate, and they said that they were never able to locate or identify this man. But for some reason, they never released the photos from this camera. And to me, I just feel like 
they definitely felt the man wasn't Robert and just kind of wanted to nip it in the bud and not attract any more attention to this incident. But a lot of people dwell on this, like, well, if it wasn't Robert, why are you holding on to the photos? Just let us see them. But apart from that, there's really only been a couple of other updates or tips of note in the case in the years following these potential sightings, at least that have been shared with the public. In May 2009, police shared that they had uploaded DNA from both Robert's parents into their system with plans to compare them against missing and unidentified human remains. Remains, human remains, because they don't actually have a sample of Robert's DNA to be able to do this. Like the Raiders cap that Robert was wearing in the ATM footage that was found in Mary's car, that had DNA on it, but they're not able to prove conclusively that it was Robert's. Same with the poop found by the car, I guess. But as of today, there have been no matches that have come up in their database. In 2012, the FBI randomly alerted law enforcement that Robert might be living in the Payson area. You remember where he would like to go on camping trips, but apparently nothing ever came of this. And then in October 2014, police raided a home in Denver after tips came in that Robert might be hiding out there. And the two men living in the home were arrested but neither of them were Robert or had any connection to him and the arrests were for possession and totally unrelated to the case. And so last year on the 3rd of November 2021, Robert Fisher was removed from the FBI top 10 most wanted list after being on there for 20 years. And this was only the 11th time in over 70 years that this had happened without the fugitive either being captured dying or having their charges dropped. And the reason Robert was removed from the list was because one of the criteria is that the publicity from being on the list will aid in the location and capture of the individual. But after 20 years with not even one confirmed sighting, it's clear that Robert no longer fulfilled that requirement. The Scottsdale police did assure the public that this by no means means that the case is over or ended and that they're still working on it and getting caught about Robert on a daily basis and they're currently going through old interviews and old tips and giving them a fresh look. I mentioned earlier that Mary's parents, especially her father Bill Cooper, had been among the most vocal in maintaining Robert's innocence in the media but clearly by November 2001 when Roberts had still never turned up and they had had time to process everything, they were left with no other logical conclusion to come to other than that Robert really had done this and they ended up filing a wrongful death lawsuit against Robert to make sure that he wouldn't be able to access any of his or Mary's money or liquidate any of his assets. But Robert never tried to do this. And sadly, Mary's father, Bill, passed away from natural causes in December 2009 with no real answers and just as in the dark as the rest of us as to what became of Robert if he was still alive out there and just living a brand new life as a free man, having never had to face justice for murdering Mary, Brittany, and Bobby. And that is where this case stands as of today. But before we finish up, we are obviously going to go over the theories because I know some of you are probably sat there with a general idea of what you believe happened to Robert or where he ended up. Maybe you're tossing up between a couple of theories or maybe like me, as usual, you are all over the place. I just find it hard to commit to one theory, you know? So let's go back to the Tonto Forest where Mary's car was discovered, which was the very last evidence found as to Robert's whereabouts. Like that's the last place we know for sure that Robert was potentially. So firstly, let's explore the theory that after Robert brutally murdered his family and rigged his house to explode, he drove into those woods planning on ending his own life. There are some people that strongly believe this to be the case, and that's why Robert was never seen again. But there are a lot of issues with this theory, because if Robert was planning on ending his own life, then why pack up all of his things? Why bring the dog? Why take out $280 from the ATM and why clean the car? 
It is true that in over half of cases of familicide where a spouse kills their family, that there will be either a suicide or an attempted suicide following the murders. However, usually the murderer will do this on the scene or not very far at all away, very soon after the murders. But Mary's car had been driven to the spot it was found a rough 100 miles away days after the murders had taken place. To me, the only way it makes sense that Robert did end his own life is if it was a change of plan. Like his original plan was to go on the run or hide out in the woods, but he saw that he had been named the prime suspect. He felt the authorities closing in and knew it was just a matter of time until he was caught. So he just decided that he would prefer to die rather than to face up to the horrific things that he had done. There's also the theory that Robert, while hiding out in the woods, died by accident in the caves. And a lot of you guys will know from the last video about the Trump family how iffy I am about caves. I do not like caves. And these caves in the Tonto Forest just sound terrifying. And possibly for someone like Robert, a great place to avoid the search efforts because a lot of them are connected in this like honeycomb style system that just spreads for miles underground. They're described as a labyrinthine array of caves, like just my worst nightmare. And several cave experts have suggested that yes, Robert could have hidden out in those caves, but not long term, because if he had been down there for too long, he most likely would have died from low oxygen levels. But what's strange to a lot of people is that if Robert did die in that forest, either intentionally or by accident, then surely some of his remains would have been found, or his clothes, or his guns, something. Even if he did die in a cave, you would think that his corpse would have attracted animals like coyotes or mountain lions who would have like scattered some pieces around, but there's never been any trace of Robert found in those woods. So what if Robert successfully hid out in the woods indefinitely? He was an avid outdoorsman, he knew the forest well, and there was the reservation close by that was never searched. And Robert did say to friends and family occasionally that one of his dreams was to go off the grid and live off the land, survivalist style, like Bear grills, I guess. And on hunting trips, it was said that he would challenge himself to survive on as little resource as possible and see how far he could push himself. And I could believe that this was achievable for a few weeks, maybe a few months, but I just can't believe that Robert would have survived out there longer than that, much less 21 years without leaving any trace of his living in those woods. He would have needed shelter of some kind. During the winter months when food was scarce in the forest, he probably would have had to steal food from cabins in the area. Like, it's just not feasible to me that he would have been able to pull this off for this long without being found out. And if that was the plan, why leave the car there like a beacon to the police saying, hi, I'm just here, in these woods. It makes no sense. Now, there is a theory that I originally blew off, but I don't, I don't know. It ended up piquing my interest and it's worth mentioning. So in the very early days after the murders, there were rumors that maybe Robert was a victim as well. Not necessarily that he had been murdered, but that he had been framed or kidnapped, which I know <laughs> sounds unhinged because literally every detail in his case clearly points to Robert being the killer and the one that rigged the house to explode. And let me say, I do believe that Robert was the killer, but there are just so many strange details that you could argue seem to point almost too perfectly at Robert. Like anyone that knew that Robert had been a firefighter could have easily set up the explosion in a way to make it look like it had been done by Robert. And really, why would Robert blow up the house at all? I guess there's a chance that it was a shame thing, like he couldn't handle the bodies of his family lying there after he had murdered them. Maybe he was hoping that the explosion would destroy evidence of the murders, but surely Robert would have known that there was no way that a fire or an explosion was going to destroy the bullet in Mary's head. And yes, he gave himself a serious head start, but surely if there was no explosion, it would have been even longer before anyone realized that something was wrong and started looking for Mary, Brittany, and Bobby. So if Robert was framed, is it possible that the explosion was just icing on the cake by the real killer to make Robert look even more guilty? And when you start thinking this way, the scene where Mary's car was found just feels so 
staged. Like it's so irking to me that there were no fingerprints or hair or DNA found anywhere in that car except for that one neat singular fingerprint on the coffee cup that it looks like Robert didn't even drink from. The hat from the ATM footage, the set of footprints leading to that cave closest to the car. It's like the more I look at it, all of these things could have been placed there to incriminate Robert. But in the end, I do feel if the scene was staged, it was all Robert and all his potential accomplice, wanting to give police the impression that he was still in those woods and that maybe he had died in the woods. And this leads me to arguably the most widely believed theory, that Robert did make it out of Tonto Forest and went on the run and found somewhere to set up a brand new life and somehow managed to stay under the radar for 21 years, which is just mind-blowing. If Robert is still alive today, he would be 61 years old, and he could be anywhere in a quiet town working in a medical position or in a menial position for cash in hand or in a busy city just blending in with the crowd because he does have a very average, everyday guy-next-door look. There's nothing striking about his appearance. He does walk with a unique posture because of his back injury and surgery, basically the exact way you would expect someone to walk if they had a sore back, like very erect with their chest out. But apart from that, if Robert changed up his hair or grew a beard or put on some weight, like you wouldn't even look twice. Robert did have connections in both Florida and Mexico, and he didn't know any languages other than English, but I mean, it's been over 20 years, plenty of time to learn a new language if he wanted to, and plenty of time to have established himself in an entirely new community. And authorities fully believe that if he did start a new life, he probably would have started a new family as well, that he would have gotten married and had more kids because as we know, he thrived in that position of being the king of his castle and probably would have seen a new family as like a messed up second chance. At the time of his disappearance, Robert William Fisher was six feet tall and 190 pounds with brown hair and blue eyes. And if you have any information regarding Robert and his potential whereabouts, then you can anonymously contact authorities using the information on your screen right now and in the description box down below and have a part in finally bringing him to justice. After like immersing myself in this case for like the last couple of weeks, I still have so many questions and I've gone back and forth so many times on what I believe may have become of Robert, whether he's still alive out there and if he is still alive, how on earth he managed to evade capture all of this time. I do think it's fully conceivable that Robert is still alive, but I could also believe that he died in that forest and the fact that Blue was found abandoned and hungry and alone makes me feel like that's almost a more likely scenario because according to Robert's sister, he loved that dog more than he loved his family. He saved Blue from the explosion. So why abandon him? Maybe Robert left Blue with the intention of coming back and something happened. Maybe he thought or hoped that Blue would survive out there in the forest somehow. Like, I don't know. Seeing as we've spoken a whole lot about Robert, though, I do want to finish up by remembering Mary, Brittany, and Bobby, who all deserved so much more and had so much ahead of them just to have it all cruelly snatched away from them. Brittany and Bobby would have both been in their 30s today, potentially with families of their own, with rich, full lives, but instead, they are forever just 12 and 10 years old, never having the opportunity to be all that they were meant to be in this world. As usual, though, I would love to hear your guys' thoughts on this case. Had you heard of it? Do you have any other theories I didn't mention? This hangout absolutely does not have to end here. I would love to meet up with you guys in the comments down below and talk it all out. Thank you so much for hanging out with me and Lily today. I hope this one wasn't too long and that you enjoy the rest of your day or night. In the last video, a couple of you message me saying you're watching the video because you couldn't sleep. So if that's the case, I hope you have lovely dreams and a really sound sleep. And if you are still watching and you're not already subscribed, then I would just love if you did that and we can be best friends forever and ever and get like matching jewelry or tattoos or whatever. Like that's just where I see this whole thing going. Oh, hi.
Did you have a good sleep? Thank you for the emotional support. You're a champ. Okay, bye. Thank you again so much for spending this time with me and Lily today. It means so much. We hope you have a beautiful, fabulous, wonderful week, and we will be counting down the hours until we see you in the next one. Bye. Thank you.